COVID has actually changed my life. I used to spend most of my time flying across this country doing cases. More than half my cases were out of Ontario. And of course, all of them are gone. There are no cases right now. So I had eight months of cases absolutely eliminated, which quickly was replaced by nine regular radio shows a week talking about COVID and two National Post columns. And then on top of that, a lot of ad hoc television radio appearances daily. So I feel like, I don't know what's gonna happen when this COVID price is over to me. I've been so immersed in it. I don't know what else, I don't know my brain is gonna go anywhere else, but we're all gonna to have to perjure. So thank you very much for having me. Let's start with the basic big picture. Every provincial or territorial government has set their own schedule based on their own health advice and the conditions in that particular province or territory with respect to reopening. And they may have to adjust those schedules. They may have to close again, reopen them, make a decision to open up and then delay that decision depending upon local conditions at the time. So the question is, is your business legally permitted to open? Because if you open without that consent, there's significant fines. And if you are allowed to open, is it absolute or are there conditions attached? Are you limited to delivery or curbside pickup? Are there limits on how many customers may be in the store or business at any one time? And quite apart from technical limits, there's limits that are definitional. For example, whatever the specific limits might be by regulation, you can't operate in an environment except in certain exceptions like healthcare, where your employees are more than six or less than six feet away from each other at any given moment. Are there specific health precautions imposed by provincial government? And can you meet them? I had a client call me yesterday and ask, can they require that every employee be tested before allowing, being allowed in the workplace? The answer is yes. And then what about if we ask for monthly tests? Because of course you're gonna be fine today and infected tomorrow. The answer again is yes. Safety trumps privacy. That's the bottom line. And most of what I'm gonna say is gonna lean in the direction of safety, but also in the direction of getting people back to work, not ruining this economy entirely, not creating an unending deficit that will last into the future and that our grandchildren won't have recovered from. So there's an interesting compliment we've got to, a balance that we've got to ultimately accomplish. So let's assume you're allowed to reopen. Are you set up to reopen in a safe way? Are you able to reopen? Now, you may have a business need to stay closed a little bit longer, but let me say this. There are some businesses that simply are not able to open. They're not essential services. The government in your respective province or territory has prescribed their opening. If all those employees are laid off, they cannot claim constructive dismissal because you have what's called a frustration or impossibility defense. If you're allowed to open or you're allowed to open now, you're not ready to open now. In other words, it's no longer legally impossible to open. Employees in most provinces have a case for constructive dismissal if they're not called back. And that's obviously something you have to concern yourself with. We'll go to the next um, slide. Thank you. There's legislation, and, and by the way, I'm going to make it one exception or two exceptions. Manitoba and Alberta. Alberta already had legislation that was helpful. Now it has additional legislation that's even more helpful to employers. And Manitoba's new legislation designed for COVID. And with Alberta, it's arguable, although likely, and with Manitoba, it's certain that the constructive dismissal claim is simply not available to employees right now because of the specific legislation. In BC, that's not the case. In, in, in the Maritimes, that's not the case. In Ontario, that's not the case. It's interesting to me, just as an aside, how three months ago, 
if you told an employee, go home, we're not going to pay you for the next two months or four months or indefinitely. Or we're cutting your wages by half or by a quarter or by 20%, or we're going to cut your work to three days a week. You wouldn't even think of doing that because you know you'd have a lawsuit in a heartbeat. Just putting back your old HR hat on and, and remembering that. Or let's look at your, your tenant and you have a landlord. You can't say, boy, landlord, my rent is $2,000 a month, but I'm only going to pay $1,500 a month. You know you'd be sued. But somehow or other, across Canada, employees are being laid off in the millions, having their hours cut, wages cut in the millions. And there's been almost no lawsuits. And that is a staggering fact. Because other than maybe in Alberta and certainly in Manitoba, the right to sue has not been taken away. But employees are realizing these really are hard times. And we'd better cooperate other, because we don't want to not have a job to go back to. Because unlike two, three months ago, outside of, say, Alberta, pretty much across Canada, it was a full employment economy. And now people are looking forward to a no employment economy and they realize they better hold on tenaciously to the job that they have. Anyway, the last slide in this one deal with health and safety legislation. And you can go back, you can go back one. Essentially, they're the same across Canada with site provisions. You've got to provide a safe workplace. You can't risk health. That doesn't mean you have to be absolutely prophylactic. You can't necessarily eliminate every possible prospect of threat. But you have to use, well, take steps as Alberta talks, but it's reasonably practicable in the circumstances. And obviously the greater the danger, the more imperiled the employee, the greater steps you're going to have to take. Now we can move to the next slide. Now, you know, as most HR people, if not all HR people, there are substantial fines, as well as public calumny for violating health and safety legislation. There's worker safety cases, claims, there's liability. And I'm gonna talk for a moment about a case in the United States against Walmart that some of you may have heard about. Some employees in a Walmart store said, you're letting people in who are sick. You shouldn't be doing that, it's dangerous. Walmart did not take it seriously. An employee caught COVID and died. His estate is now suing Walmart for millions of dollars. Now, if you have workers' compensation, that's where that claim would go. But if you don't have workers' compensation, or some employees aren't covered by that, we are talking realistically about multi-million dollar lawsuits, quite apart from breaches of occupational health and safety legislation and fines flowing from that, we're talking about multi-million dollar employer ruining lawsuits, as well, again, as brand damage. So you've got to be very careful how you handle this. Reasonable precautions obviously depend upon the circumstances, but it's not business as usual. And check your public health authority, check government prepared resources, check what the situation is in your province, check what your chief officer of health is saying, but stay on top of it because it's changing every single day. You've heard the Canadian chief medical officer, Mrs. Tam, her ever changing what you can do, what you can't do, masks aren't good, now masks are good. The bottom line is, and by the way, it was obvious to anyone who thought for two seconds that masks are always helpful. If for no other reason, if you sneeze, you're going to catch much of the sneeze and you're not going to affect other people. That's rather obvious. But the point is, if you can say, I followed public health prescriptions to the letter in my province and federally, you've got a very, very good defense to a health and safety claim. So stay on top of things. Now, what you've got to do is think about 
what are the hazards in my workplace? If you look at my column on this last Saturday in the National Post, which I commend you, I go through a reopening checklist for every employer. And I'm not going to bore you with that now, but it's all there delineated in last Saturday's National Post column. But one of the things is, what are the hazards? Are there shared workplaces? Are there high traffic services? Address them. It require employees to sat have sanitizers there and require every time a photocopier is used, every time anything that is commonly touched is used, they have to, an employee is required to sanitize it. Make sure people are not allowed to walk down the hall at the same time. Spell that all out in writing. Distribute a memo to your employees and then on top of that, post it through the workplace. Erect barriers, separate workspaces, maybe require shifts if you have too many employees for the amount of space that you have. Implement alternating working schedules. Maybe let people work from home. And that's a real issue, which I'm going to address in just a moment. But figure out what your workplace needs to stay entirely safe and then communicate that to the employees with a return to work protocol, our firms doing a lot of them right now, and customize to every client, and then require employees to take those steps. Because if they don't take that steps, it's disciplinable. And make clear to them it is disciplinable if you do not follow the various guidelines set up, including obviously social distancing. Let me pause for a moment about working from home. Employees are loving it. There's a right study that came out, the pollster, who found that something like 78% of employees now say they want to work from home at least part-time in the future. Employers aren't loving it so much. I got to tell you, in my law firm, I'm hating it. And I required this week and last week, we, re we required people A to L to come on odd days, M to Z to come on even days to phase in, and next week it's full at the office again. We've taken this proper safety precautions to permit that. But the reality is, even if an employee could prove that they are more productive from home, there is no legal right to work from home. It is the employer's decision where your employees work. And you've got to decide for yourselves, first of all, whether certain jobs can tenably be done from home. Secondly, if so, are they as productive Thirdly, is that particular employee as productive working from home? Can it be trusted? Because a lot of my admittedly empirical experience is it's great for two or three weeks. People are, are on their toes. And then, well, no one's watching. If they're not at their desk, no one, subject to having tattleware on their computers, no one knows the difference. And they get into other routines, which are not as commodities to working as working in the office. But again, you've got to decide that as individual employers, how much of that you're prepared to allow, how much we're prepared to tolerate, you're prepared to allow it one day a week or no days a week. And where it becomes tricky is at the margin where somebody is, for example, particularly sensitive to COVID-19, they're immunocompromised and they're old, for example, or they've just come back from maternity leave and they'll say, I can't come to the office. And You've got to accommodate their status under human rights legislation so you might decide you want to let them work from home. Now I have a case right now involving an insurance client and that's the debate. She's returned from maternity leave but as it happened during a maternity leave she worked a few days from home and the employer said I'm getting no value from this at all. I don't want to pay a salary to have you to get 20 percent productivity. And in her job, which is assistant, I need around the office, dealing with things, taking things, handling things over, being part of a team, part of a network. And you can't do that at your house. So what I propose to the client, which they've offered to her, is this. You can't do it at home, but you pick your hours. Your husband has to work when well, he's a carpenter, so he can't work at home either. But between the two of you, there'll be time that you can come to the office. That's the time we require you there. Pick your own hours, whether it's weekends, whether it's mornings, whether it's two times during the day, three hours apart, whatever works for you, but we're not gonna let you work from home. And she'll probably bring a human rights complaint because she's not prepared to come back to the office. I don't think she was gonna come back to the office anyway because of other issues, but that is 
that particular dilemma, and I'm confident we will win on human rights ground or on destructive dismissal ground or on any other occupational health and safety ground or on any other ground. Let's go to the next, the next slide. So as I said, if you have a health and safety committee, consult with them, deal with how symptomatic employers are gonna be treated. Obviously, you have to make it clear post that they are not to attend the office. They are not to come into the premises. You could not have a Walmart case and let someone infect your workforce. It's as simple as that. And if they have symptoms in the office, employees should report that. They should be asked to leave immediately. Test as soon as possible and not allow to return until they've tested negative or at least until two weeks have gone by after self-quarantine. In my office, we have PPE but don't require it because we have social distancing, but we have it available for anyone to use. We have masks to supply it. I recommend that to everyone. So if someone was uncomfortable, they have a mask. Limit unnecessary business travel, limit unnecessary interaction with customers and clients. Focus with them on how they will interact with customers and clients or members of the public to make sure they always stay six feet away. And ensure that your landlord, for example, we have We've even set a description for how people will ride in our elevator, making sure they sit on the four corners of the elevator or stand in the four corners. Don't get any closer to anyone. Don't go in the elevator with more than four people. We talk about that in our guideline in our office tower in downtown Toronto. Make sure your suppliers and vendors or anyone who attends your premises either stays some distance away from any of your employees or has proper precautions in place. Okay, next slide. Now, there's privacy issues. Privacy law does not go away because of COVID-19. But let me say this, safety trumps privacy every time. If there's a conflict between the two. You still though have to handle personal information including medical details, in the same way you would have before, with one exception. And this may not be the advice you receive from your counsel, because I've seen various law firms write exactly the opposite. I just think they're dead wrong. If someone has COVID-19, has been in your premises, you have a duty to inform other employees that might have come into contact with them unless they're in a very anomalous workplace where they can know with certainty who they came into contact with. Maybe they're in a small little area, there only are three other people, fair enough. But if there's someone who might walk through the premises, they're not necessarily going to remember. And I think you're negligent if you don't ask people who they might have come into contact with if they've come into contact with that person. Now that obviously, even if you don't say why, reveals that that person has or is suspected of having COVID-19 and that's a privacy breach. But in this case, it's one that I believe is entirely defensible. And in fact, something that you should do and not doing it is not defensible. Let's go to the next slide. Similarly, if you want to monitor employees' health, ask about the symptoms, taking temperatures, do it. Do it in a way that's minimally intrusive. Do it in a way that's safe. Do it in a way that's conducted by people who know what they're doing with thermometers, thermometer checks. You don't want someone putting their hand near the mouth of the other person. Have somewhere available to put the th thermometer down, the person who's being tested picks it up. They never come within six feet of each other. They take their temperature, they tell you what the reading is, they put it down so you can verify the reading, but at no point are they within six, put it down on the counter again. The person then come, moves back, the person comes and takes it, looks at it. They're wearing gloves the whole time. On no occasion can they be six feet away from each other, but you have an absolute right to monitor whether someone coming to your workplace might have the symptoms. But you can't go beyond that. It's like labor arbitration cases that some of you may be familiar with that say, when you breach privacy, you can do it for a valid purpose, but you have to breach privacy in the most minimally intrusive manner possible. And then once you collect the medical information, you have to store it and ultimately not publish it and ultimately save it in a way that is prescribed and that you've always done respecting medical and other private information. 
explain the processes in advance to your employees, tell them we'll store the information longer than is necessary. Let's go to the next slide. Now, lots of employees don't want to come back to work. And they may refuse to return to work. And this is perhaps the biggest issue that my clients right now are experiencing. And you know what? It's honestly inherited. They hear Christopher Freeland saying over and over and over, if you're not safe, don't go to work. Stay home, stay home, stay home. And all of a sudden you're the employer saying, come to work. I need you back at work. And they're saying we've been told by the government not to come to work. Well, it is true that the pious aspirations of even our prime minister is running afoul of legitimate employment law obligations. And in that respect, employment law obligations trump the aspirations of staying in your house. You do the things we've talked about, I'm gonna delineate my national post. If we go back, I haven't finished that slide yet, please. Um, thank you. Make sure that everything is safe. But if it is safe, you have no legal obligation to accommodate anxiety. They have a right to refuse unsafe work. And you have to have a dialogue. My advice to you, as I did with in my own firm, is dialogue with your employees. Explain in advance what you've done to make the workplace safe. Do it in writing. If someone has concerns, talk to them about it. If they still have concerns, they have a legal right to refuse unsafe work and call an occupational health and safety inspector after talking to you. They don't have to work until the inspector comes. But once the inspector comes and says, the workplace is safe or it isn't safe right now, but you make these one or two adjustments and it will be safe. You can turn the slide now. They have an absolute, you have an absolute right to require the employee to come to work. Next slide, please. Thanks. And we have examples of the Occupational Health and Safety Act in various provinces. We can flip through those, which essentially state what I just delineated. Next, please. Next, please. Next slide. Thank you. Next slide again. Great. Thank you. No, you go back one. Thanks. So, if they point out a legitimate concern, fix it. And then we follow the procedure I've just set out. But you can absolutely require them to work if you have a safe workplace. As I say, there is no legal obligation to accommodate anxiety or trepidation or nervousness. If the workplace is safe, they have no right to stay home. If they refuse to come to work, you can fire them for cause for bad, and you can tell them. I will be issuing a new record of employment for termination for cause for abandonment of your job. You will not be entitled to serve. Next, please. Next, please. Thank you. And a lot of people don't want to return to work, especially in lower income positions, because they're getting served. They're getting $2,000 every four weeks for not working. Why should they work? Or they've been allowed to stay home and get their full salary. Why should they come back to the office? Why should they leave their home? I mean, from their perspective, they don't want to come back to work. They're happy collecting serve and not working or working from their home. And being told in this environment, when a lot of their friends and family are at home and other and people are saying to them, it's dangerous to go to work, don't go to work. They don't want to go to work, but they have to go to work if it's a safe workplace. Now, while their complaint is being investigated, you can't force them to work. You can give, at least not in that job, you can assign them a different task. If they say the entire workplace is dangerous, then you have to unfortunately abide by that until the inspector comes and designates it safe or tells you the two changes you have to make, in which case you have to make them, and then they have to attend work. And of course, you cannot have any reprisal against employees who exercise the right to a, a work refusal, even if it turns out to be unsubstantiated and without any real merit. So now we go to human rights. 
human rights commissions of most provinces publish policy guides to deal with COVID-19 specific human rights problems. But again, stay on top of your provincial government or territorial government's commissions guidelines and advice as well as those of public health authority and make sure employees are treated consistently because of course that is what generally causes human rights problems, inconsistent treatments. You have to accommodate employees with code protected characteristics, disability or family status or age up to the point of undue hardship. I was just making a point, I had clients say to me, I've been laying off people, generally the older people, because I want to keep them safe. No. If you don't need your full workforce, you can go to older people and say, I appreciate it's unsafe, would you like to be laid off? And if I say I'd like to be laid off, I don't feel very safe, fair enough. But don't pick your old people for layoff because you're gonna be smack dab in the middle of a human rights complaint and quickly. Next. If an employee is perceived, not necessarily has COVID-19, perceived to have COVID-19, for purpose of human rights legislation, perceived disability is a disability, so you can't discriminate against them because of that. Now, you have a right to order employees to stay home if you believe they have the virus, even if they protest that they don't, but obviously they're subject to sick leave policies, whatever they may be, if you have sick leave policies. But you can't, again, be entirely arbitrary. You've got to have some reason to believe they may have COVID-19. Otherwise, that again is discrimination under the human rights legislation. And if you have to send them home and require them to self-isolate, you've got to try and accommodate them to see if it's possible, for example, if they can work from home or perform some other work in order to maintain their income. Now, it's got to be useful work. It can't be work, as an example I gave earlier of this recent client, of no real value to you. And it is not discriminatory to lay off employees because there's no work. What we are seeing happening, though, when you go to the next type, thank you, is companies are using COVID as a pretext. All the employees you've long wanted to get rid of are now being terminated under the guise or laid off under the guise of COVID-19 with the employer, praying they find another job, having no intention of ever recalling. If those employees turn out to be pregnant or otherwise fall within human rights legislation, you're gonna have a real problem down the line. If you're seen to have selected those particular employees for layoff over others. If the court or human rights tribunal judges that but for they're having these protected characteristics like being pregnant, you probably wouldn't have laid that person off because you lay off everybody. You're going to have orders of reinstatement, human rights damages, punitive damages, as well as wrongful dismissal damages. Now, you have to accommodate employees with diabetes, the immunocompromised, those with respiratory conditions, but that doesn't mean you can't require any of them to work. If there's any risk at all, the answer is no. But let me give you an example of my office again. For lawyers anyway, they have their own offices, they can walk up the stairs, they're on the eighth floor. There is nothing that makes working here for a lawyer with their own, or anyone with their own office, or any of your employees with their own office, any less safe realistically than working from home other than perhaps having to take public transit which has not been viewed as a reason that they can't come to work employees are responsible for how they get there and they can't say well i would take public transit therefore i can't come to work and by the way just to test this theory on behalf of a client i googled rent cars and i was finding rent cars in toronto for seven dollars a day not a shock I expected something like that because what are rental cars used for? Why should just kind of clear bankruptcy? People flying in to the, to the province, flying into the city. That's who rents cars generally. Well, there's hundreds of thousands of rental cars sitting idle right now throughout this country. In any event, people with 
who are more vulnerable medically may require additional accommodations, such as altered work schedules, shift in duties, and permission to work from home. Next slide, please. Family status is also protecting characteristic child care obligations. And again, you have to accommodate up to undue bur burden or hardship. Or if an employee has to watch over their children, they may be entitled to accommodation on that basis. In fact, they are entitled to accommodation on that basis. Now, the question is whether you have to pay them. That's another issue. Presumptively, if they have to be looking after the children during the day because schools are closed, and they have to be teaching them uh, remotely and otherwise looking after young children, they don't have time to do their job. So my view is presumptively, you do not have to accommodate them. And the government, the feds, has created that as a specific ground for obtaining CERB having to stay home to look after your children because daycare and schools are closed. Now, they may make an argument that they can work even with those distractions as effectively from home. And in the margin, there may be cases where those arguments can be made effectively. For example, they'll say, I can work from five to midnight every night, in which case you may see them go to the office from five to midnight. But, but in any event, you have to look at each case contextually and ascertain whether their argument makes sense. The other thing you can do legally, and this applies not just under COVID-19, but generally when an employee says, I have to stay home to look after my child, I need a leave of absence for this period of time, you have to accommodate that. Not usually a problem with daycares closed, or daycares are open and schools are open because they can always find daycare. But just as the case is normally, the case still remains. You can say, okay, that's fine. We understand we're a big organization. We're gonna open up a daycare in our offices. And the employee cannot say, well, I don't want my kids mixing with all of these other children. I don't know what their conditions are at home. That is not an excuse. You have a legal right to open up a daycare and require your employees to take their kids there rather than stay at home and take time off. Or you could also, if you can find daycare for them, find other daycare for them proximate to their home or your office. Again, tough to do right now, but legally that is an option for you. Next slide, please. Now let's assume an employee refuses to attend work and you've taken all the necessary precautions. You met your duties to accommodate. The employee has no contractual right to work from home. For example, some employees may have always worked from home, in which case it's a constructive dismissal if somebody seemed to have to work in the office. But let's assume the employee, like most employees, has always worked in the office. It's then, as I said earlier, cause for their dismissal. Next, next, um, next slide. And it's cause for them not to obtain CERB. Now what if, and here's a tough conundrum that I'm experiencing regularly. The employee doesn't want to come to work. And you know why. They like being at home, they like collecting CERB. They like working from home when you allow them to. You're not prepared to allow them to anymore. So you say, We've got a safe workplace. We're legally allowed to open. Come to work now. They say, oops, love to, but I've got COVID symptoms. What can you do? Order them to come back faced with that. You could have a serious negligence action against you by everyone else there. You could have work refusals by your other employees. In any event, you can't let them come in. So what are your options? Not much. In Ontario, for example, and some other problems, you can't even ask for a doctor's note right now. So what are your options? Hiring a private investigator, observe them, asking their friends what they've been up to during those days. Are they doing things inconsistent with the symptoms they claim? But short of that, there's little you can do other than follow up with them regularly and ask for their recovery. And ask if they've been tested. Ask, to see if, ask them to get a test and see their test. That's the best remedy, but depending on the problems or territory you're in, that could take some time too. It's tough to get tests in most provinces. Next slide. Now, what about some of the things you should not do because it will get you sued? Obviously, general wrongful dismissal law applies. Claiming an employee there's cause to fire someone because they have COVID-19 is obviously nonsense. We'll get punitive damages awarded against you. Firing someone for refusing to work in an unsafe workplace is presumptively 
something that will take punitive damages, alleging frustration of the employment contract. Well, that's the argument all employers are making right now, hoping the court will buy it. But I've got to tell you, the law is very much against that unless there's specific legislation like there is in, New in um, Manitoba and Alberta. The courts have said economic impossibility is not cause for discharge. And even though the company is essentially bled of its assets, the employee may win nothing at the end after but they look at their judgment. Firing someone like older employees because they're at higher risk for COVID-19, people putting people on temporary layoff, even though they don't have a contract permitting that. Again, Alberta and Manitoba accepted. Reducing hours for compensation. All of these are constructive dismissals. <clears throat> now, when can you lay someone off? One, if they're in a union, it's permissible. Two, if you have a specific employment contract, and here's my advice, all new contracts put layoff clauses in, then you can do it. But almost no contracts in this country, I've seen few in my career of 41 years, have layoff clauses as opposed to termination clauses. Or if they're in a seasonal business where historically they work for four months, then the, you're slow and then they are laid off and they come back. In other words, there's a history in that particular company of layoffs followed by recalls. But other than the union positions, those two other exceptions probably represent 3% of non-union employers in this country. So the reality is for the other 97%, a layoff is constructive dismissal. What I've been doing with my clients is giving people a choice. The choice is either we're going to lay you off or we're going to terminate you. Your choice. We'll lay you off subject to recall or we'll terminate you and, and pay you whatever you're entitled to. Of course, the offer may not be very high, but um, they presumptively can sue for wrongful dismissal. I've got to tell you, faced with that choice, about 98% of employees are selecting layoff. Why are we doing that? Because once they select layoff, having been given a choice, they can't turn around later and claim constructive dismissal. If there is no such bargain and you just lay them off and they accept it, either by agreeing to it or not suing for two or three months because continuing in the new, in this case, layoff or reduced work week becomes an acceptance legally then it's too late for constructive dismissal. And moreover, you've now been given the right to lay them off in the future, reduce their wage in the future. Whatever you've done, if they've accepted it, if you haven't paused it as a one-time basis, but just done it, you have the right to do it in the future. You have the right not to reinstate the wages to their former level if they accepted it and if you have not said it's until business resumes or until for three months or until health authorities have ordered us to fully reopen if you've not said any of those things you've simply laid them off cut their salary they've now accepted so either in terms of a cut in salary there's no legal reason why you have to ever bump it up again or in both cases layoff or reduction salary you've given yourself a new term of the employment contract to do it again So we've talked about human rights. Obviously, you can't dismiss an employee who's believed that COVID-19 is immunocompromised if the commission or court believes that's even one of the reasons for the dismissal. If a code protected human rights code, protected characteristic is even one of the reasons for dismissal, it's a violation of the human rights code. So not only is it a wrongful dismissal, there's also A, an order of reinstatement, and B, human rights additional damage and see punitive damages because the court will think it's calumnious conduct to fire someone for protected characteristics under human rights legislation. Next slide. Now, some provinces have passed legislation allowing employees to take unpaid leave for reasons related to COVID-19 such as Manitoba and Alberta. The frustration argument with all other employers you're making isn't going to work subject to that legislation. I talked about the unilateral changes a moment ago and the limitation periods in most provinces of this country, they're two years, but in some jurisdictions, they've been suspended 
by legislation for COVID-19. Next slide. Well, I suspect many of you are already aware of these issues, which don't apply specifically to COVID-19, but the general wrongful dismissal damages. They are aggravated damages for mental distress, for bad faith Honda damages, punitive damages for inappropriate conduct, reinstatement and back pay if it's a labor board reinstatement or human rights tribunal reinstatement, and of course, reasonable notice. Next slide. Now, once they accept a layoff and accept it for a couple of months, they can no longer claim constructive dismissal unless you pass the statutory maximum permitted in your respective provincial or territorial legislation allowed, permitted for layoffs, or you open up for business again, call people back, but don't call them back. At that point, it immediately turns into a constructive or wrongful dismissal. But when you're hiring them back, why not take the opportunity to revise your employment contract to give yourself a right in the future for temporary layoffs or change the duties or compensation? But always, when you're going to have a new contract, you have to give them something in return for it, a raise, a bonus, something new. Because when you hire an employee, and I'm not talking about COVID, I'm just now talking more generally. If you hire an employee and you make a job offer to them, they accept, they come to the first day of work, and you, and you give them a contract to sign, and they sign it, and that contract has non-competition clauses, termination bridges, it's totally unenforceable. Because they already have their deal. They came based on the deal. There's no consideration. You're not giving them anything new in return for these onerous provisions. And the same thing applies anytime during employment. There has to be something new they get. It doesn't have to be worth anything. It could be a dollar. But, but something new, and that's why you see in releases, the consideration of one dollar and other consideration. That's consideration. It's got to be something in return for these changes that are to their disadvantage. You have to return them to the same role, otherwise that's a constructive dismissal. So I think the courts are pretty loose about that right now. I've had a lot of employees of my clients say to me, or at least the clients are saying to me, employees are saying that we don't want these new jobs to put them, but we're making do. We have a limited number of positions right now and everybody's making do in these times. So they're not doing the same job as before. I think a court will have no sympathy for an employee who in the middle of this pandemic says, not my job description and claims constructed as finished. I think that employee will lose. But short of that, on a more permanent basis, a layoff's a constructive dismissal, a salary reduction of more than 15% is a constructive dismissal, and less than 15%, they still can sue you for the difference for a period of reasonable notice. They simply can't resign and claim wrongful dismissal damages. Okay, let's, next slide. Unionized workplaces. Obviously, you follow your collective agreement. You follow the same legislation we've already talked about. If you want to make unilateral changes, it's a function of whether or not the collective agreement is propitious to the employer in that reciprocal. I found it's better to deal with unionized employees right now than non-union employees in some respects because you have an absolute right to lay off unionized employees, whereas a non-union employee in most provinces, it's a constructive dismissal. Make sure the employee, the union is informed of whatever changes you're making. That is critical. You don't want to argue. You don't want them to argue, I should say. You don't want to have an argument later on that you didn't negotiate in good faith because coming up to bargaining, you didn't tell them about a change that you were already planning to implement, for example. Or after bargaining, you kept quiet and then when the bargaining was over, all of a sudden you began implementing changes that you should have negotiated with them. In any event, you want the union as your friend, not as your saboteur during the change you're going to be having to make during this period of time. Sick leave, well, again, most any legislation is incorporated into collective agreements. And obviously, many collective agreements provide for much more than that. Next slide. Oh, last slide. I guess it's time for questions. And I'm ready for them. Well, Fire away. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Howard. So much information and uh, concisely put in such a short space of time. So thank you for that. 
Um, on the questions, we have had a lot coming in already. So thank you everybody Great. who put the questions in. Um, for those who are, uh, for those in the audience, if you just a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, it's not in the chat box on the right hand side. It's in under the engage tab and then the Q and A tab within the engage tab. Um, Howard, we could ask you questions for the rest of the day that have already come in, I think. Uh, obviously, we only have a little time until uh, 11.40 uh, or so. So I'm going to take the, what, the questions in priority order. So if you're on the phone, uh, sorry, if you're, if you're watching um, and you'd like to upvote on the questions that are already there, please do, because I will be taking the top ones. Uh, the, the leading one right now is, what is the ergonomic responsibility of responsibility of employers in these difficult financial times when employees are working from home without ideal setups? Well, that is a really good question. And unfortunately, I'm going to tell you that it is your responsibility to accommodate your employee's disability. So if we're talking about a disabled employee who requires certain accommodation, look, what I have done in my own office, because I have an employee who, a lawyer, in fact, who needs a certain ergonomic accommodation, is pay to transport his work set up here to his home for the period of time and, and then transported back when we resume. That might be the least expensive means of accommodating, but accommodation you must. Okay, thank, thank you for that. And we have another a clear leader here. How can employers not accommodate anxiety when anxiety is a legitimate mental health disorder? No, it's not. Psychiatric disability is a legitimate mental health disorder. Anxiety, we all have some anxiety, we all have some stress. And I wanna make this point generally to the employer audience listening. Employees are stressed every day. I'm stressed every day. I'm sure everyone listening is stressed every day at some point or other. That is not a disability. To be a disability, I don't, I'm not saying it's gonna to have to be a panic attack, but it has to be stress and anxiety is such a point that they're actually disabled from performing their function, not just nervous about coming to work. So it is not a, dis it is not a human rights disability unless it is actually a disability and anxiety itself is generally not a disability. There are many a human rights case on that point. And that's a good lesson for employers generally. You don't have to give stress leave unless someone is so stressed as to be disabled. Excellent, thank you, Howard, for the clarity there. Uh, next question. How about when an employer refuses to come to work because they take public transit and are not able to socially distance and they feel this is unsafe? Well, first of all, my experience is, at least in Toronto, which is all I can speak to, I'm stuck here, as we're all stuck in our respective towns right now, you take public transit here, you can socially distance your heart's content because they're basically empty. So I check that theory with a the practical reality before assuming it is the case. And most people on public transit are distancing themselves from each other. So that's the first point. They may well be able to socially distance on public transit. Secondly, it is up to the employee how they get to work. It is not up to the employer to determine how they get to work. And as I was saying earlier, right now you can rent a car for almost nothing and get to work that way. I know in Toronto, for example, my car is parked right outside in a no parking area because police are not issuing tickets. So I'm fortunate that way. That's Toronto. I suspect that's true of a lot of cities right now. They're allowing people to take their cars to work and not have to take public transit. Don't know your particular town, but if that's another option, you don't even have to pay for parking. So there are ways of getting to work, but that is the responsibility of the employee, not of the employer. And that is not a legal ground to allow them to stay home. Thank you, Howard. And very interesting because that was very popular and obviously has caused a lot of uh, concern and questions. Next question. Is the employer slash office environment required to provide sanitized wipes or masks or can they request employees to bring their own at their own cost? I have, in fact, provided masks here. That question has not been tested yet. 
in the courts or with occupational health and safety branches. I would say if you can, it will make employees feel a lot more comfortable. If you offer to supply masks, I have to say I brought a lot of masks and not a single employee has asked to use one. So I would think given that masks are now easily available, you can require employees to bring your own, their own masks. But as a matter of good human resource practices, I would let them bring their own, but offer to supply them. Perfect, thank you. Next question. Can we require an employee to prove they are immunocompromised, i.e. medical evidence? You cannot do that in Ontario right now. I can't speak to every other province. Generally speaking, historically, yes, you can. Our premier has instituted new legislation for this crisis, not allowing us to ask for medical notes. Now, um, you, that doesn't mean you can't say to the employee, you say you're immunocompromised. I've never heard of this before. Why do you? Uh, do you have? Is there a, and and hope they come up and give you a medical note. But if there is a if you're in a province that doesn't permit you to ask for medical notes, then you can't, and therefore you can't you can't obtain proof. And I find that unfortunate because I believe employers should be allowed to ask for medical notes because they don't ask for medical notes and know they can't ask for medical notes. More employers are more likely to abuse sick leave claims. So that's the answer. If you're allowed to ask for medical notes, the answer is yes. If you're not allowed to ask for medical notes in your respective province or territory by the legislation there, then the answer obviously is no. Thank you. And uh, I think this is an interesting one coming up. To what extent do OHS obligations extend to an employee's home if they're working from home, brackets indefinitely, i.e. the definition of the workplace has changed? That's a really good question. And the employer can only do so much. They have to take reasonable care. And I, I think the answer is it does, but the employer has to take reasonable care and precaution. So they have to ask the employee, for example, other than your direct family, we want you to stay socially distant in your home. We want you to keep a safe workplace. You don't allow people into your home. We want, it, we want you to operate in a safe way, but they can't go in and monitor it. Because for one thing, you can't have, you can't have people going to other people's homes right now. So yes, it does but the obligation is to be put on the employee. And that's the kind of discussion you'd have with the employees to what they're doing to maintain a safe workplace at their home and require employees to keep a safe workplace. Because ultimately, although there may be that obligation to ensure on the employer's part, it becomes the employee's obligation because they're the only one with access to the house. And it might be a good thing to ask an employee, is there anything in your house that prevents you from working safely? And then working with the employee to resolve those problems because you can't go into their house right now. So therefore, if they do something unsafe and you had no reason to anticipate that, it's not your problem because you've attempted to have the employee work safely even at their home. And it's part of the discussion you should be having with your employees when they go home and work or when you permit home from work from home. Excellent, thank you. And uh, this one, we're like looking for your opinion on this on Howard. Uh, what do you think will be the biggest disruption or new precedent set in employment law as a result of the pandemic? Well, I think the biggest new issue, two, I'm going to give you two. One's legal, one's not legal. The non-legal one, which I think will be the biggest disruption, is the desire of employees to work from home, employers tolerating it, and then at some point realizing this isn't working for them, for at least a large number of those employees, and then trying to get them back to work. And of course, at that point, they can claim we've agreed to my working from home, either entirely or two days a week or three days a week. So if you force me to go back to work five days a week, it's a constructive dismissal. That will be a massive disruption that I see coming. The second one, which is entirely legal, is this. All of a sudden, employers have got used to laying employees off, reducing their wages, reducing their hours of work. And once appetite is whetted, employers will do it again. And the question will be whether they can do it with impunity. They could do it with, they cannot do it with impunity right now other than those provinces that legislated the permission for that. But if they've done it with impunity this time, without agreeing it was a special exception and they won't do it again, 
They'll be doing it with impunity in the future because the employees accept it. It's become part of the contract of employment, or they'll be putting that into people's contracts of employment for all new employees or existing employees. And employees are going to be finding that they're having their hours cut, they're being laid off, and there's going to be a huge morale problem and disruption in the Canadian marketplace as a result of that when employers start using those legal tools, which they've got now for the first time, have never used before or almost never used before. I see that being a real change in employment law. And I'll make one other point before finishing back to working from home. Think about this. Once an employer is comfortable with employees working from home, and let's assume you're in Winnipeg or Vancouver, does it matter if the employees in Winnipeg or Vancouver? You're getting used to Zoom, meeting, Zoom here, Zoom meetings. You're getting used to phone, telephone conference calls. You're not used to the employee being in the office anyway. So why does it matter if they're in Vancouver, if you're in Vancouver, or in Winnipeg, or anywhere else? For that matter, why does it matter if they're in Canada? And if I'm paying an employee to do IT or a call center employee or many, many, many jobs, why not hire them in India and pay $3 a day rather than $300 a day or $500 a day? I, of course, I'm making up numbers right now, but you get my point. Or Vietnam or anywhere else in the world. We've already had outsourcing to some of these countries, but not like will happen in the future. Because once there becomes an environment of working from home, that leads inexorably, in my view, so it doesn't matter where people live. Therefore, let's find the cheapest labor we can find for a particular type of job. Why wouldn't we ultimately for corporation or obligations to our shareholders? We're trying to make profit. That's what business means. And there's going to be a massive hit on employment in Canada and the unemployment rate flowing from this. And people who are advocating working from home haven't even put their mind to that problem. In fact, I haven't heard anybody talk about that. But it's such an obvious, inexorable, logical consequence. It will happen. That will be the biggest change and disruptor. Thank you, Howard. Uh, fantastic insight. And uh, we look forward to maybe not look forward to seeing what happens in Don't the future. Look forward to it. <laughs> um, look forward to my being wrong. Yeah, we'll, we'll wait to see what happens uh, with bated breath. Uh, okay, another good one. And this kind of flips the situation uh, that you talked about earlier uh, in reverse. If employees do want to return to work and their employer, employer uh, does not want them to return, such as facing issues or focusing on essential staff, is that our legal right? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure I entirely understand the question. You mean they want them to continue working from their house rather than the office? Or they simply don't want them to come back to work was the question. Well, then, they, time. Dis then they dismiss them. So you can dismiss employees. It's called, it's wrongful dismissals. You have to pay wrongful dismissal damages subject to whatever you can negotiate or whatever employment contract you have. And hopefully you have one or what, or what you're able to, or ultimately a court will determine their entitlement if they mean if the question really meant, because I know these are text questions, if the question really meant, um, I don't want them working in the office anymore, and let's assume you have space for them in the office. It's not a matter of safety issues and offensive impossibility. You've just decided we're going to downsize. We're going to have fewer, smaller office space. It's cheaper for us to have people working from their house. That's a constructive dismissal. Just as it's a constructive dismissal before somebody working remotely to suddenly come to the office every day, it's a constructive dismissal or do the reverse. What if it was temporary? What if, if it was, we don't want you to come back yet? I think that's ready. fine. They're home right now. So if, they, if it's another month, they've, ar they've already accepted it. So you're just really increasing it and continuing it for another month. I don't see that being an issue. Okay, thank you. Great. Now we move on to safety. After all safety measures are in place, if the employee or someone in their household is medically vulnerable to COVID, do we then need to accommodate? It depends on how safe the condition is. I have a lawyer here whose, whose wife has cancer. He's coming to work every day. 
because he has his own office, his own door. There's no safety risk with him. If, and, and there's different types of immunocompromisation, of course. Some are very vulnerable to this and a risk of death. Others are not very, and not a great risk, even though it's a different type of immunocompromisation. And you've got to be reasonable in the circumstance of each individual case. People have a right to refuse work depending on their particular condition. It's not just, it's not an absolute standard. This is safe and therefore everybody has to work or it's unsafe and therefore no one has to work. There are gradations in, in the middle when it's, when it's safe, but there might be a couple of people who it's not safe for. And one issue would be, I have someone who I live with who's severely immunocompromised and might die if they catch COVID-19. Well, unless it's as safe a workplace as mine is with shut doors and no reason to ever leave your office if you don't want to, then I don't think that would be a legitimate excuse. If it's more on the margin, then it would be a legitimate excuse for that particular employee. But lots of employees are pulling the immunocompromised card. I'm immunocompromised, my wife's immunocompromised. I've never heard of so many immunocompromised people in my life is from what I, the stories I'm hearing from my clients. So we go back to the earlier question, how could you verify whether that's the case? And in some provinces you can't, but you would if you're able to verify quite what the condition is and, whether, and get a doctor's opinion on whether or not there really is legitimate risk. For example, if somebody's 75, they are at greater risk than somebody who's 30, obviously far more greater risk. Does that mean they don't have to come back to work? No, generally they still have to come back to work. You have to take reasonable steps, not prophylactic steps. But again, it depends on the workplace. Excellent, thank you for uh, another fantastic answer. Uh, I think we move on to privacy now. Uh, can we ask our staff to answer a few short questions when they come to work each day to ensure they do not have the symptoms or exposed to someone who may have? Yes. As I say, safety trumps privacy. Yes, you can do that. Good. Short. <laughs> I love the short answer on that one. Uh, there are layoff clauses. It, sorry, start again. There are layoff clauses in our employment contracts. Some staff have old contracts. We don't want to square, scare them. How do we update them? Well, look, that's your decision as an employer, whether you want to scare employees with new contracts or not. And that's always the conundrum. Employers want to put non-competition clauses, and they want to put termination provisions, and they want to put layoff clauses in. You can't do it in a manner that's concealed, or the court may find it unenforceable anyway. So you're going to have to be open about the fact that you're doing it. You have to give consideration and return for it. In other words, something of value you can do it at raise time. But you have to give them the choice. You don't have to sign this, but you won't get the raise. Or at bonus time, you don't have to sign this, but you won't get the bonus unless they're already entitled to that bonus. It's got to be something new they weren't already entitled to in return for signing it. Will employees be upset? Some will. A lot of employees sign employment contracts with absolute equanimity. Others are very concerned and won't sign it and will resign and sue rather than sign it. You've got to take each case individually. But the bottom line is you can't force them to sign it if they're already an existing employee and you have to give them something in return for it. And how you massage it depends on the employee in question, your workforce and your corporate culture. Different for everybody. Next question. Uh, on day one, our speaker, Melissa Agnes, shared that the role of HR is to take what legal provides and then to wrap it in human speak. Would you agree? Well, that is certainly one aspect of HR. There's much more than that. There's much that HR does that isn't particularly legal in nature, but that is true. Um, but I, I would put it a little differently. HR should know this stuff. HR should educate themselves on the things we're talking about today to the extent you can. There's a lot of information and therefore it's a lot to integrate. But it's not just a matter of, but to say just interpreted human speak means you take it and you apply it holus bolus. You don't necessarily do that. You've got a corporate culture you have to maintain. You may decide you're not comfortable with doing something that I'm recommending. 
That's inconsistent with your corporate culture. You don't simply take what I say and make it say it in plain English. You take what I say and decide, do we, other than obviously you're not going to break the law, but in terms of whether you're going to take some of the tougher steps I'm suggesting, we're going to say, well, that may be the law. We might be able to do this, but our company doesn't want to do this. And that's part of the role of HR too, to decide to what extent you're going to take the law and do things that will be unpleasant to some employees. A, a good example of that is how tough you're going to be on employees you believe are fabricating sick leave claims. Are you going to go by the book or are you going to let it go? Are you going to, um, even though you can lay people off, are you going to? Or are you going to are you going to go to work sharing instead? Or are you going to, I mean, you've got to decide once you have the tools of the law, how you're going to, how it, and more important, if you're going to apply those tools. Thank you, Howard. I think we've got time for one more question. We're back to uh, the anxiety uh, issue. If someone has mental health issues slash anxiety and does not want to come back to work, should we support them to claim short-term disability and long-term disability? If someone is anxious, they're not entitled, in my view, to short-term disability, unless they're so anxious that it's become an actual disability. And if you um, do that, I would strongly recommend, if you were my client asking this question, I would say, don't do that, because short-term disability pays full wages for 12 weeks, let's say, it depends on the SDD policy, but in most SDD policies apply for both full wages about 12 weeks, then 70% for another, say, 14 weeks. You're incenting lots of people to claim they're anxious and not work, and you won't have a workforce left, and the people who are, who are coming into work will resent the people who are claiming they're anxious, and they'll decide, well, I may as well claim I'm anxious too. So I don't think you should, and I think it's bad HR policy at the end. I think you're gonna have trouble getting a workforce. You're gonna have a lot of people who are demotivated. You're gonna have a lot of people taking advantage of the system. And most important, Anxiety is not a disability unless it's crippling anxiety to the point of an actual disability, but 98% of anxiety is not, does not constitute a disability. So it's not, for, it's not, A, doesn't qualify for short-term disability, which is, remember the word disability, and B, isn't protected by human rights legislation.